what are the important skills of data journalism? I mean, is it storytelling? Is it data acquisition, data extraction? You know, um, I'm, I, I, I've come from a strange background because my background is as a news editor. I found the first day of my job was September the 10th, 2001. So kind of I got into this thing early. But really, the stuff that we do is not rocket science. A lot of it is just using spreadsheets. It's using, you know, kind of finding the right things. I suppose the biggest thing for us is really knowing what questions to ask of the data. So it's treating the data like any other kind of information, which for journalists is a new thing because journalists are used to being kind of slightly scared of maths and slightly nervous sure, of what sure. it means for them. So. So, in regards to how the stories come together, do sure. they start with access to a database, or do you have the story idea and then you seek a database that sort of meshes with that story? Um, it really varies. I would say um, recently, because of the way the world's going and we're suddenly getting access to these enormous data sets, that um, we've done it from that way around, that we've had, for instance, besides WikiLeaks, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow, um, we've had these enormous kind of spending databases released in the UK, like every item of public spending over £25,000. Uh, you know, that's 160,000 items, which normally, in the old days, what would have happened is a set of reporters would have sat in a darkened room just gone through it line by line. Mm -hmm. but we can use these kind of techniques to analyse that and break it down and work out what the stories are and find out, say, who the big suppliers are or you know, which companies seem slightly dodgy or things, stories we should look for. But often um, what it is is we've got like there's a story in the news and we're starting to think, well, what data set would go well with that? What can we add to that? And a lot of the work the data blog does is actually um, publish and make accessible data sets that just happen to be in the news and they're interesting because, because of their happening at the moment. So I, I know along with a lot of the coverage that you guys do that you also make available kind of online access to the data sets yeah. themselves. Do you have a sense of how much people actually get into that? and what they might be doing with that information. Well, you know, when we launched the data blog, we thought it was just going to be developers. I say just, but you know, that would, we would have been perfectly happy if it had just been developers going on developing applications and so on. What it turned out to be, actually, is real people out there in the world who want to know what's going on with the story. And I think part of that is the fact that um, people don't trust journalists anymore, really. They don't trust us to, tell, to be truthful and honest. They don't trust the media. And so there's a kind of hunger to, uh, to see the stories behind the stories. What's, where do we get that story from? Is, it, is our analysis right? Is the data right? And it's that has kind of driven this thing, so suddenly we're at a position where we're getting a million page impressions a month just in our data pages. And so what we do is we publish stuff using Google Docs, we make it accessible and shareable, and in the UK there's a big problem with uh, government and official data sets being published as PDFs which means that they're useless to a man or beast. So what we do is a lot, a lot of is cleaning those up and making, putting those data sets in a way that they can be used and people can get something out of them. So the sense I'm getting is actually um, people come to look at data sets because they want to find out what's really on behind the story. You mentioned PDFs, and I know that's sure. an unstructured format, and that's a big issue. Yeah. How did you guys address the unstructured data that was in the WikiLeaks logs? Well, it really depends which, which WikiLeaks release you're talking about. There are, there are three WikiLeaks releases. The one and two, Afghanistan and Iraq, were very, very structured, actually. We got a, a CSV sheet, um, which is, okay. yeah, it was basically the, um, the SIG Act, which counts, stands for Significant Actions, the SIG Act database. And what that was, essentially, guys on the ground, when they're in action, after they've been in action, they would uh, do an entry in the database, or after they've been to a village, uh, to, a village to deliver some aid, or any kind of action or mission or anything they'd done, it would get recorded in this database. And it's full of acronyms and military jargon, um, which to me actually makes it more interesting because it feels more authentic. Mm -hmm. um, but there's very, very detailed data in there. There's uh, latitude and longitude of every instant, as well as um, the military coordinate system, which is called MGRS. There's a cover kind of summary, which is a bit in plain English that gives you the sense of what happened. Mm -hmm. And there is a kind of every event is categorized by a category and a subcategory and so on. And it's dated and timed. Sure, yeah. So it's an amazing data set. Right, and right. In some ways, really easy to work with. And we can do incredibly interesting things showing uh, where things happened and uh, events over time and so on. Uh, with the cables, it was a different kind of kettle of fish, mm -hmm. as I say in, in England. It was, um, it was just a massive text file, uh, very, very variable kind of equality. It wasn't like we could just look for one thing and think, oh, that's the end of one entry and the beginning of the next, sure. or that's the end of one column and the beginning of the next. So uh, we had a few guys working on this for a long time, for two or three months almost, just um, trying to get it into a state where we could have it in a database. And then once it's in a database internally, we could 
um, give it to our reporters to start interrogating and getting stories out of. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, what you're going to have is a group of people going through 251,000 documents individually. Yeah. So, um, in a way, with Afghanistan and Iraq, the work that we did was much more um, user-facing because they used to share a lot of the work we'd done. Mm -hmm. But with the cables, because A, it was a lot of unstructured stuff that we had to structure, but really for our reporters. And secondly, because we had uh, agreed not to publish the full set of cables for obvious kind of security reasons, there was stuff that was redacted. We published about 700 or so. We will have published about seven or 800 cables by the end of this, this period. Maybe a few more, but there's 251,000. Yeah. So yeah, we have to make those selections. Mm -hmm. And you know, people talk about the, um, the internet killing journalism. But actually, in our case, this has worked the other way around, because what we've done is combined kind of, you know, specialist journalists have an incredible knowledge of the story hmm. with the technology that enables them to access their stories. And that, that's how you get the publication. So it's a different kind of beast to the other two releases. And the other two, in a way, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to get anything out of those spreadsheets without kind of data journalist skills. Mm -hmm. And I think with uh, the Wikileaks cables, it requires those skills, but it's much more about the slog of going through and looking for specific stories. So, for instance, you know, just last week we started publishing documents about Egypt mm -hmm. and about um, the US and the West, other Western governments' involvement with Egypt and support of the Mubarak regime. So, is you know, suddenly there's a news hook for us, kind of looking for more documents that perhaps we haven't looked at or bothered with before. Great. Well, thank you very much for being with us. I appreciate well, thanks it. Thanks for having us.